The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, exploring with you the orchestration by Ravel of Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. We're halfway through the ninth movement, and we left off last lecture with this series of repeated G's. Do you remember that the music was going bum 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 bum? You might recall that Ravel added two extra bars here, but that doesn't really make any difference because he doesn't change the music otherwise. Notice the change of tempo and the change of meter. On Dante Mosso, what you'll notice with most conductors here is that they tend to have the tempo, right? So if you think about this as being one, two, one, two, we get a beat that is about the full length of the previous bar, right? So these two beats fit into one beat. If you think about it, bum 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 right? So it's about the same tempo, just in half. Along to this little measured tremolo here in an E minor third, gives it all a suitably creepy kind of a feeling. Once again, Mussorgsky really excelling at the sense of the macabre. But I think there's something more happening here than just trying to put the listener on edge. I think that what he's doing here is depicting the clock, right? There's a certain kind of measuring going on here, and I think that that is why conductors are wise, whether they know it or not, to keep the tempo pretty much regular, just in half, according to the previous section. There's a certain amount of very, very strictly measured scoring here, and the same thing is going on here. It's almost like the clock ticking, in a sense, but of course ticking in a very spooky way. Very simple scoring when you think about it, but nonetheless very effective. These sneaky little octaves underneath the fluttering right hand. And turning the page, you see that it develops quite a bit, leading to this bar where the music sighs downwards in the left hand, and then trading off between the hands, sighs upwards. Of course, as a pianist, I might decide to just play all the flutters with my right hand and keep them very, very much controlled, and then have my left hand play over my right hand. That's probably just the easiest way to do it. I think trading off hands would be really, really fun, just to show that you could do it, and that you could get perfect evenness between the hands. But in the end, it's just kind of funner to go hand over hand here. Finally, we get back to this uh, little augmented fourth, and here Mussorgsky is definitely telling the pianist to go hand over hand. And what is being picturesquely implied here, I feel, is the striking of the clock. So how many times does it strike? Two times. So it's 2 a.m. So plink, 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 plink. That would definitely be our witching hour, right? So it's 2 a.m. and the clock is telling the story of Baba Yaga. And who knows what might pop out of that clock on the hour. You don't want to know. Notice that the right hand scoring is changing from these fluttering sextuplets here and just becoming an unmeasured tremolo. Although the pianist might elect to just continue to measure them out in the same exact proportions rhythmically. That would probably be a decision that I would make as well. 
to just continue on the sextuplets. But aside from going from measured to unmeasured, the left hand is more or less the same, and the whole strategy of descending is pretty much the same. And then when we get to this descending, sighing downwards forth, it completes itself by going the full octave, and then some, all the way down to E. And once again, the sense of striking 2 a.m. is repeated as this uh, trembles its way all the way down to a voicing of a G diminished chord here. So that is really the meat of what this lecture is going to be about when I analyze the orchestration for this particular half of the movement. Because as you see, the next section is pretty much the same as the first section. There are a few different touches, like the beginning here, instead of going bum bum, bum bum bum, it just bonk, 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 bum 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 bonk, bonk, bum 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 bum, and so on. There's some condensation here too. There's some telescoping here as well, with the amount of times certain passages are allowed to proceed. Like for instance, this idea here was eight bars in the first half, and here it's telescoped down to four bars. And this is the same. This is the same, that's the same, and all pretty much the same, more or less. The big difference really is that at the ending, once we get down to these bustling little half steps and thirds, instead of going to bum 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 it just turns around and goes right back up the hill again, <laughs> All right? And in this case, instead of doing these little jagged downward reaching fourths and diminished fifths, Mussorgsky opts to doing a modified Phrygian kind of scale. So starting on G, leaving out the first scale, which doesn't have an A flat, let's go to the second one, which does. We've got G, A flat, B flat, B natural, which you could kind of think as like C flat, right? And then jumping up to D, E flat, F, G. So it's kind of like a minor scale where the first two steps are minor, which is similar to a Phrygian. And then the fourth step is also a diminished fourth, right? It's a very cool idea. And it has that, once again, very nervous, unsettling sound. People are kind of unsure whether or not Mussorgsky had the training to really think ahead in situations like this. For instance, Tchaikovsky says in his diary, or perhaps it was a letter to his patroness, that Mussorgsky was incapable of working on a single bar without assistance. <laughs> And I think that that is possibly the school teacher in Tchaikovsky, the ex-harmony professor, being very critical of Mussorgsky's very blunt and unpolished kind of work, according to Tchaikovsky. So would Mussorgsky known enough about modes and alterations to have come up with this all by himself, sort of thinking ahead? Or would he have just invented this scale himself? So I would tend to sort of suspect the latter, that he kind of stumbled across a lot of these interesting harmonies and so on. But all that aside, Mussorgsky adds poco ritardando, and this is blazing upwards, ataka to the great gate of Kiev. Now, we are not going to look at that today, obviously, but I just wanted to let you know where this is heading, so you won't be all that surprised if you don't know this suite that well yet, by the crashing, splashy chords of, once again, the promenade coming back to claim its own over the entire suite. Well, we'll get to that in the next lecture, next month. But for now, let's jump back to that first half a page, where Baba Yaga's clock starts its infernal ticking and 
perhaps even creeping around the room of the person who owns this interesting piece of very Rococo-looking machinery. So the first thing that we have to look at here, which is naturally taking up most of the horizontal spacing, is the instrument which Ravel decides to score as the little fluttering sextuplets here. And that, of course, is the flute. Notice that no flute player has the lung capacity to really hold on to such a passage played very low and controlled for all that long, especially at half the speed of the previous section. So Ravel trades off, dovetailing on the very first note of each bar between first and second flute. And this goes on for quite a while. Continuing on to the next natural note to trade off with, which would be clarinet. One still hears a bit of difference there in the timbre as the clarinet takes over. So the whole question is what instrument could Ravel have chosen from that time that could have carried this on seamlessly? And one sort of thinks maybe the alto flute could have taken things down a little bit further. The problem with that is that once you get to around here, we get past the alto flute's range descending and then we have to trade off with another instrument, possibly bass clarinet or clarinet, and then the difference between the timbre is even more pronounced. Were it not for this solo here in the bass clarinet, perhaps it would have been more seamless to have the bass clarinet take over directly from the clarinet here. And that is just something that I feel as an orchestrator is my perception. Maybe not yours, but bass clarinet played softly in its lower clarino register and going over the throat tones, I feel has a very distinct relationship to the timbre of a flute, especially in the flute's lower register. And I've sometimes used bass clarinet as a third flute in situations where the two flutes are playing harmonies in their middle and middle to lower range and then just having the bass clarinet support from underneath very softly. Okay, well, be that as it may, it's mostly low flutes and then the clarinet's coming in to compensate and even just a little bit of bass clarinet there at the end before the first flute takes over again. One little thing to notice here is that Ravel tells the second flute to change to piccolo, and we will check out the consequences of that in the next screen for this lecture. But for now, let's jump back to the melody instruments. We've got staccato bassoon plus double bass. But then notice that the second note of the bassoon is just a simple half note with the plucking of the double basses giving more of a bite to its articulation, right? We're actually seeing that quite a bit in this suite in terms of Ravel's orchestration. Repeat it again, and then this really has the most wonderfully creepy kind of articulation and 
essence. It's the actual creeping sort of creepy, right? Actually creeping around the room kind of sound. Could this perhaps be depiction, not just of the clock ticking and perhaps crawling around the room, but also bringing to mind Baba Yaga's hut, slowly approaching its destination with Baba Yaga preparing some sort of very evil spell. There are a lot of different ways to think about this, but I think that there is a sort of a dual purpose going on here and that Ravel was thinking about it very much. And it pretty much continues on with those instruments till we get to this sighing downwards, which is answered by the sighing upwards. Mussorgsky has very, very generously scored those upward sighing fifths on the pitches of A and E, which are incredibly simple to play on stringed instruments using harmonics on the note of a fifth. This says on the D string, right? So the D string being down here, up a fifth is this A, which is notated with a diamond head, going up to the same thing, a fifth up from the A string, and this is played by both groups of violins, octave below, the cellos, and this has an incredibly glassy sound, especially if it's played sol ponticello, which the string players often elect to do. So that happens twice. And then the final one is taken over by the violas. And I feel that that is Ravel attempting to sort of wind things down. Even though it's the same pitches, the violas have a more mellow sound and also it is one less string group, right? The downward sighing is really what interests me here, and that is bassoon and then bass clarinet over the same exact notes. Remember that the transposition for bass clarinet is written up a ninth from the sounding pitches, right? So if this is an A at the bottom of the bass staff, this is a B, below the bottom of the treble staff, right? So that is up a ninth, so it's the same exact notes. But the difference in character between these two timbres actually makes the bass clarinet feel lower in a way, right? And it kind of is if you are thinking in terms of <laughs> the actual harmonics that are being used. This is actually a half harmonic not a full fundamental, <laughs> which is just the strange uh, mathematics of how closed tube versus open tube playing works. So I go into a lot of detail about this in my orchestration course that was recently released, the 102, 103, and 104 courses on Mac Pro Video about wind instruments and the wind section, but you don't need to worry about it. Just that the clarinet family, and especially bass clarinet versus bassoon, is using different fundamentals than everybody else, like the bassoons and oboes and flutes. But you can see there that this is incredibly effective. And then the same notes are played on the open strings in the basses. So that is a lot to take in, even though it's really not that much information, it's just little subtleties. So listen for all of those things. Listen for the way that the flutes trade off to clarinet and how that really does represent a change in timbre. It's not a perfectly subtle dovetailing leading to a new timbre. It really is a change of timbre that's probably quicker than what Ravel might have intended in ideal situations, but probably he was not going to ask for instruments he couldn't count on every orchestra having. Remember, Kusevitsky's commission of this piece was for a big tour all over the world. He was going to make this the centerpiece of his massive world tour, and he couldn't count on every 
orchestra having all those instruments. And in fact, he may have actually asked Ravel, look, keep this simple in terms of instrumentation, just standard instruments everywhere. Or perhaps Ravel knew that very well without having to be told. Then listen for the perfect blend here of pizzicato and solo bassoon, and how, once again, the pizzicato of the double basses adds a wonderful little kick to the articulation of the bassoon going forward. Then these natural harmonics on open strings and the way that the little downward sighing changes from bassoon plus pizzicato to solo bass clarinet and then double basses. And now on this next page, we see why Ravel was truly the master. Even in simple orchestration like this, he really shows that he is a tower of ingenuity in small touches and in the overall scope of his vision of how the orchestra should sound. Since this is basically a revisitation of the previous idea, Ravel is going to make sure that it isn't just the same orchestral colors, that this is going to be a variation. So it represents a development of orchestral texture. Remember before that I was pointing out how the pianist might decide to just stick with sextuplets here in this unmeasured tremolo that was indicated in the piano score. Well, Ravel is not going to be happy with that. He is going to change to instruments that are able to maintain that kind of instrumental special effect very, very nicely and subtly, as opposed to the flutes. And in fact, you see this dovetailing right here, going to this final G in the first flute, with the second violins taking over dovetailing right into this. And this is another place where the trade-off can be almost imperceptible if the orchestra is really listening to each other. And very, very simple for the second violins to continue onwards indefinitely, right? All they've got to do is just change their bow. They don't have to worry about running out of breath. And all of these descending pitches, at least for this screen, are within the range of their instrument very easily, just taking it all the way down to this open D string. So that just leaves the melody and the striking clock, right? So let's look at the melody first. We've got a parallel double octave in the cellos and double basses. So if this were just an octave, of course, because of the double basses octave transposition, then the cello and double bass parts would be written exactly the same. But since the cellos are written up an octave, that leaves a space in the middle. And that space is filled with tuba. I have to say this is a really cool idea to have the double bass pizzicato on the bottom, the cellos pizzicato on top, and then right in the middle of this triple octave, we've got the tuba just playing its jolly way around. And this really has the most moody, dark sound when you hear it performed. A really great contrast to the bassoon plus double bass that we heard on the previous screen. It has this kind of strange, bustling, extra creeping around kind of sound to it. And it also helps that the harps are playing unison along with the cellos and double basses. Now, notice how the harp is scored as B flat and the cellos and double basses are scored as A sharp on that same note. 
that just has to do with enharmonic tuning and the resonance of flat strings versus sharp strings. So a harp string tuned to a sharp is a little less resonant than one tuned to a flat because the flatter the string, the longer it is, right? So the length really does matter. Even if it's just like an inch or two longer on the same pitch, it will have a richer, more resonant sound. And here is a situation where the harp scoring is absolutely great. Notice the lack of dynamic marking here. Probably better for the harpist just to know that they've got to match what's going on with the melody in the other instruments. So they might be virtually playing perhaps um, mezzo forte or even forte in order to balance, but it works great to have them doubling the pizzicato here, just because everybody is playing softly. If there was any force involved at all, it would be very hard to hear the harp, or perhaps impossible to hear them. But it really does add to that creepy sound. Notice here, we have the same pitch being enharmonically played, and this is also to keep from buzzing, right? From stomping on the note. So if you had two B-flats in a row, they would be playable, but less than ideal. So here is Ravel adding that little touch, which by the way is one of my orchestration tips to avoid buzzing by trying to play enharmonic notes or, or just avoid repeating notes, especially with lower strings. Now here, since we have a B natural coming up, Ravel has to use the A sharp. And then he says, hey, go to C flat here. And that is so that the two B naturals in a row can be played and harmonically without stomping as well. Now if we explore what else the harp is doing here, then that naturally bridges us over to what is going on with the clock striking. And here I feel that Ravel is being influenced very much by Russian orchestrators, especially Prokofiev, who was quite fond of underlining things with xylophone. And in fact, I really feel this is the most like Prokofiev that he sounds in this arrangement. So just a tiny dash of cymbal behind it, a nice hard note on xylophone, and it actually can trick the ear because of the way the rest of this is scored into thinking that the xylophone plays octaves here. It goes bum bum, bum bum. But no, it's just playing a single note there. And the percussiveness and abruptness of everything else just makes the ear fill it in. So here we've got our two piccolos, two petite flutes, are playing this little E third jumping up, which is actually right here in concert pitch. E here and G there. So that's our basic idea of the clock striking from the piano score. It's that same chord that we see here in the celesta. Remember that celesta is reading an octave lower than the sounding pitches, right? So that is just essentially doubling. And the celesta has a fairly discreet sound, but it will be heard very clearly in this very soft sneaking around arrangement that is behind it. Nevertheless, Ravel underlines it with these little harp harmonics sounding, as you should know by now, an octave higher. So it is essentially the same notes here, <laughs> these E thirds, which also sound an octave higher than written. And those notes are also being played by the Divisi first violins, G on the top staff and E on the bottom staff. And notice that he's managed to sneak in the A sharp here and a little G below, just to underline it a little bit. And this is very easy to play on a violin. It's right under the fingers. This G note is very easily crossed over by the third finger to play this A sharp on the E string. So yeah, pretty simple uh, fingering. I would actually feel that this is harder, not by much, to play this and then reach over and play that E third. 
Not a big deal, really, either of these. But this one is actually easier. So it just adds up to that very alert clock striking the witching hour, right? And the approach is so perfect here that naturally it's repeated pretty much note for note, even though the melody develops into different pitches. But everything else still works great, so Ravel leaves it alone. Then we get to those sighing downward notes. Tuba solo, which is great if you have a fantastic tuba player. They can really make this sound delicious. And then contrabassoon playing very, very low grunty notes. It can just sound incredibly forbidding. It can sound like a contrabass clarinet with this kind of open scoring above it, just very little else going on. And if you look at the arranging here, it's a quite seamless dovetailing downwards from second violins doubled exactly by violas to the same thing trading off doubling exactly by the cellos as the pitches just become lower over this bar and descending downwards and keeping the violas and cellos together. Now this is really really neat here and just shows some common knowledge about scoring this kind of stuff for very very low strings and that is that this kind of fingered tremolo is not the most ideal thing for basses. I mean they can play it but it's really not that clear and this is heading towards extremely soft bustling that is going to be behind the tam-tam anyways. So Ravel opts to have the basses just basically play a standard unmeasured tremolo underneath the cellos and that's good enough. Do you know what I mean? It means that this approach which becomes harmonized here, excuse me for not mentioning, can be maintained throughout here uh, with this sort of chordal fluttering back and forth without too much fuss and bother. But the real stars here <laughs> are the tam-tam which basically blots out any pitches anyways to the normal ear even played pianissimo and the last striking of the clock now notice in this case Ravel puts the xylophone on the end and here you finally get a bum bum on both pitches but this is all just pretty standard because there isn't any chord involved that Ravel needs to transcribe right so just E to E, probably using open E's as much as possible in both groups of violins. The same pitches transcribed directly for flute. Piccolo taking the top notes here and oboes and clarinets. It's actually quite a piquant sort of sound here to combine all of the instruments in this way. And I feel that this is a situation where pizzicato and xylophone helps to keep the ear from becoming too absorbed into the peculiarities of combining all the instruments in that way. Keeping it from sounding too wind bandish, do you know what I mean? So there is the essence of wind band in that, uh, using so many different instruments on the same notes. But because we've got the pizzicato and the xylophone note, it keeps it orchestral. That is something to think about if you are using a lot of this type of scoring. If you intend to combine winds a lot, but you don't want it to go in that direction. So let's listen to both of those pages all the way through and just keep an ear out for all of those things, especially this wonderful idea of the tuba in the middle and the pizzicato of lower strings and the plucking of the harp on the outside.
There are quite a few pages left in this movement. However, there's very little across all those pages that we haven't covered in the first lecture. So I will take a look at those little changes with you now and then just run this entire thing so that maybe you can just have another look at it and notice some things that you didn't notice before. But as I pointed out when we looked at the piano score, instead of starting with bum bum, bum bum bum, we're just starting with bonk, bonk bonk, bonk bonk, da 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 da, right? So to capture that, Ravel is going to change around the orchestration. A big arco note, bam, right here. And then he says, hey, take off those mutes to the cellos and double basses. And that's just the luck of it. There's no opportunity for those players to really remove their mutes unless the conductor gives them time, right? There is a big splash on the tam-tam just before this bar. So if the conductor is keeping an eye on those players and they have time to move their mutes very quickly off of the bridge, then they can start this without the mutes. Just boom, which is much more effective. One big stroke on the bass drum and a little blipping kind of staccato there by tuba which, by the way, is doubled by the lower horns. Remember this low D here actually sounds on this G. So we've got tuba plus fourth and second horn plus second bassoon and bass clarinet. And then on the upper octave here, we've got G below middle C, which is being played by first bassoon and clarinets. And then, of course, contrabassoon is doubling this very, very low double bass note, right? So that is enough of a savage blow here to bring us back to reality. And it looks like Baba Yaga's on the prowl again. As things go forward, basically Ravel just dispenses with any further involvement from the strings and just has the timpani come in and hammer away. And I have to say that in the context of these very savage octaves, that just adding the timpani here pretty much obviates the need for any strings. You just Because of the wonderful, colorful resonance of the timpani with its very, very definite pitch, it's almost like this bass drum plus the strings equals the effect of the timpani all by itself, right? And then from that point forward, the bass drum can be saved just for underlining very, very emphatic places in the music, like the beginning here alongside this pizzicato, where the lower winds and the horns go bum, 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 right? It's extremely energetic, and if you compare it to the first page, then you'll actually see that the first strategy is probably a lot less scary for the conductor and the winds to try to completely nail. Now, this is not impossible or even all that hard, but it is much harder than the first interpretation. So it really behooves everybody to completely nail this, and I would say probably for like a semi-pro or a community orchestra, they might take a little extra time or even do a sectional to try to get some of this playing accurate. Also, stuff like this, too. As I mentioned before, this is half the bars that we saw at the beginning of the movement. So Ravel just condenses it all down by having harps plus bassoons do those little middle-of-the-bar notes that transcribe the accents in the original piano score and then just give that over immediately to the lower heavy brass and the horns and just allow the lower winds to contribute to the gradual crescendo here up to fortissimo. And then from there on, it's pretty much the same exact orchestration and arrangement 
until we get to the last couple of pages. So at this point, in the first half of this movement, we went to bum 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 right? But here we can see that just the little back and forth of half steps and thirds continues on a little while and then just starts to work its way up. Remember that we've got the measured tremolo here on all these eighth notes. And what I find interesting is looking at the way that these winds cascade downwards, right, which let's just break it down a little bit. Uh, octave oboes plus octave clarinets with the flute kind of cascading down at the top and then having the oboes dovetail into the English horn and a two clarinets, bass clarinet taking up the bottom octave just straight over from this C sharp to this D here, and then the bassoons bolstering that, then changing to octaves here in the bassoons with the bass clarinet taking the upper note and so on. Okay, so now let's turn the page and we see as the violas come in and join in and the second violins enter the picture, they're actually coming in doubling the cellos at first, right? And then as the cellos get to a point where it's probably not that comfortable for them, they jump down, so do the violas, so that this line remains consistent for the second violins, who are then joined by the first violins and so on. Okay, now if we look at the winds, we see those octave bassoons coming in, bass clarinet continuing its upward sweep, but those octave bassoons jumping down, and then the second joining up with the upward sweep of the contra bassoon. And our little English horn comes in here to double the A2 clarinets, and they just keep going upwards to be joined here by A2 oboes and A2 flutes. And so you can see that there's a similar approach on the way up, but it's not quite as integrated. It's more direct so that the players who have seat partners and not auxiliaries can all be playing together. So A2 bassoons, A2 clarinets, A2 oboes, and so on, right? As opposed to having octaves on the way down. Because this is just going to become fiercer and fiercer and more and more manic. And <laughs> that is something where you just do not want to take any chances. And then, of course, right at the end, everybody comes in together across the scope of four octaves in the winds. And in the strings, we're leaving out the top octave here in the piccolo. So um, that that's fine because with the piccolo on top, you really don't need the first violins to really reach that high. And, and you just would be driving them to unnecessary heights here. Notice that the cymbal has just been rolling right along here. So it's joined by snare drum and ratchet of all things. This would probably be a wooden ratchet, not a steel ratchet. But that just really, literally, ratchets up the excitement, right? And that is leading, as we saw before, directly to an ataka with the Great Gate of Kiev, which we'll cover in the next lecture, because this one's getting long enough already, even though there's so much recap. So let's jump back to the Allegro Molto at 94, and focus on those change sections, the way the winds and strings swoop upwards at the end of this movement, and of course, listen for the differences here between this and the opening of the movement. And I'll see you next month for three lectures on the Great Gate of Kiev and the end of this entire suite.